Okay, I think we can start now. Uh, uh, hello everyone, welcome back. Uh, we're uh, pretty lucky to have uh, Professor Michael Frank from the Brown University as the keynote uh, speaker today. He's a professor of computational cognitive and psychological sciences there. Uh, uh, very briefly, I can say his research combines uh, multiple levels of computational modeling to understand the neural mechanisms, underlying reinforcement learning and um, decision making. Uh, okay, Michael, uh, I hope you're fine and many thanks again for accepting the invitation. So take it away, please. Okay, well, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be able to speak with you, uh, even though it has to be uh, online these, during these times. Um, and I, I don't know what your tradition is, but feel free if anybody wants to uh, interrupt and ask a question along the way, that's also okay with me. Um, let me, okay. So I'll just dig right in. Um, so I know a lot of you are familiar and you've heard a lot about reinforcement learning in different contexts. Um, and uh, it's fair to say that in industry and in companies like Google and Facebook and other ones, uh, deep neural, net neural networks have been combined with reinforcement learning to achieve lots of impressive things, including uh, winning at complex games like Go and um, many other things that neural networks have been able to solve through reinforcement learning. Uh, one of the big papers that came out five years ago by the DeepMind group was applying uh, a neural network, um, which I'm not going to go into details at all, but it does a sequence of transformations in order to try to control a video game um, joystick controller um, to then be able to play in an end-to-end -end fashion, meaning it observes the just the pixels of video data from a real video game from Atari and has to control uh, different 18 different movements in the output. And then all it does is get a reward signal and it is able to eventually learn um, to play at the level of humans or above. So this is that single neural network trained on all these different games from Atari and all these games that are above this line, it's performing above uh, human performance. And then there's some that it performs worse. Um, and so that was sort of touted as a, in some ways, general artificial intelligence because it was the same system that was able to play many, many different games. Um, and that's impressive as opposed to uh, many of the AI applications in, in industry generally tend to be focused on training a network to do one thing or training some system to do one thing and it get, becomes really good at doing that one thing and that's all. However, it's easy to see limitations in those kinds of systems. So what I'm showing on the left here is if you take one of those neur neural networks and you train it to play this game uh, breakout where it's controlling this paddle, the joystick is controlling this paddle and it's getting this video data. Uh, and then there are these little balls that it's controlling and it's able to you know, move the paddle at the bottom in order to break the, uh, the tiles here and to perform the game properly. Um, but then if you take that same network that's trained and it, it, it actually, if you, if you let it keep going, it would perform this task you know, really well and, and perform the, uh, get lots of points and so forth. But if all you do is offset the paddle by two pixels, so this paddle now is a little two pixels higher than it was over here, the same network completely fails. It just keeps on losing. Um, and that's the kind of uh, problem that you see in many of these uh, neural networks is that they're, they become good at what they were trained to do. But they don't necessarily generalize outside of their task. Uh, and even in the previous slide where I showed that the network was able to learn all these different games, the, the, um, what they actually did was they trained the network on one game at a time, it performed well, and then they had to, every time it switched to a new game, they had to retrain it from scratch and it would forget everything it learned about the previous game. And so that's not the kind of uh, 
abstraction and generalization and transfer that we expect from human or biological intelligence. And so one of the general motivating goals of my field of research is to try to understand what makes humans uh, smart, what makes them be able to, what is special about the brain and the cognitive system that allows us to learn uh, representations that do transfer across different tasks. Uh, and one way I like to motivate this problem is from a completely different question that's bothered me for a long time, uh, really well before I became interested in, in the computational approach to this question, um, which is why does motor learning develop so slowly in humans? And hopefully you'll see the connection to the, to the question I, read, I asked in the, in the beginning. Um, so on the left here, you see this picture of these kittens that are uh, a, few, a few weeks um, old and they're doing these sort of marvelous feats or they're jumping and fighting each other and running around and uh, uh, you know having fun and on the right is a picture of my twin kids when they were just uh, uh, a couple of months old uh, looking up at me and uh, I wanted to be proud of them <laughs> but uh, it was hard to to really be marveled at how an how uh, amazing they were on the motoric side because really they were just staring and looking up at me and not really doing much. And so one question is why are children, why are human children so impaired when they're at, born at doing basic aspects of motor function compared to many other animals? And one of the standard accounts for why that is, is that infants are born earlier than they normally should be in some sense because uh, humans have a large head and there's a small birth canal. And so the idea is that the human needs to develop further outside of the womb as if it has a fourth trimester, like one more set of three months for the, the child to, to develop as if it was still in the womb and it's just not really meant to be out there in the real world in some sense. And while uh, I'm not challenging that, um, I don't think it's sufficient. So if you look at what happens in three month old infants, which is after that fourth trimester, uh, they're still pretty incompetent. So if you're like me and you have kids and when, you, when your kids are first developing, you tend to go and look at the milestones of what uh, they should be achieving. And one of those is called babycenter.com. And you can look at what are the milestones after three months. Uh, and it says, uh, you no longer need to support his head. When he's on his stomach, he can lift and his head and chest, he can open and close his hands. So it's not really mind blowing stuff compared to what you see just in these kittens or mountain goats or many other uh, animals. And so my hypothesis is that uh, the human brain is wired to discover, to search for and discover what we'll call latent generalizable structure. Uh, and hopefully that'll become more clear as I go through the task, uh, but the mechanisms needed to discover that and to show the kinds of transfer that we would like uh, inherently involves a lot of in initially inefficient learning. And, uh, and so it's going to be slower. You're going to be slower to learn just very basic aspects of motor tasks at the beginning, but then you accumulate knowledge and structure in the world that allows you to be much more flexible and generalizable uh, later on. And later I will uh, return to the infant question just very briefly to say that it's uh, been studied actually in infant, infants a little bit. Um, and I'm not gonna show this video, but I, my, I, I, it's hard for me to go by and showing a picture of my own kids when they were a couple months old and say I wasn't proud of them because later on, uh, of course, now I'm very proud of them. Now they're nine years old. And in this video, uh, I had pictures of them, uh, videos of them speaking and talking about different brain parts and then doing it in uh, in d two different languages. So later on, they do actually become uh, abstract and be able, are able to surpass and well surpass the capabilities of these infants. Okay, so what do I mean by uh, rule structures? So first I'll, I'll give a few different examples of that before I get to sort of more, um, you know, the, the way in which we study it in the lab. So here on the left might be, if you go to the UK uh, and London, you, you might learn, uh, a set of driving rules, like how do you drive on the road? You know, what do you do at a roundabout? When do you, do you wait for the person that's left? Do you drive on the left side of the street and so forth? Um, uh, and then if you go to Montreal, which is where I'm from, you notice that there's a whole different set of driving rules. There, things are a little bit uh, 
hectic. You drive on the right side of the road. People don't obey the rules quite as much and, and so forth. And there are a different sort of set of norms that you should apply if you're driving. Um, and you wouldn't want to learn one set of driving rules in one city and then just have to apply a completely different and, and relearn those driving rules in all other cities that you experience. So this is just sort of a, a funny thing, but the point is that there are many other cities in this case, like Chicago, where things are just as hectic as Montreal, and you have to be able to navigate the roads in a way that maybe you want to transfer something about what you've learned here to a different city. Um, okay, so how does that relate to structures that we can study in the lab? In cognitive psychology, there's this notion called a task set, which is essentially uh, a linking between various different stimuli or states that you're in and the actions and the outcomes uh, that they correspond to. And that that kind of uh, a structure is embodied in, uh, is connected to each other in a way that can be recalled in various different contexts. So you might have a cue in, in the example I was giving on the last slide, that cue might be like what kind of city you're in, um, but it could also be a, um, other contextual features of the, the room that you're in or whatever. That then links to how you should map match stimuli to actions. Uh, and so in a cognitive psychology experiment, it may simply be that you see different shapes, like a triangle, a uh, circle, and a square that we'll call S1, S2, S3, and that those should be linked to different actions in order to get uh, reward. So either you're doing it through reinforcement learning, or maybe they're even just instructed that you're told when you see the circle, press button one, and so forth. And so this would be a task set. It's a set of actions that get linked to uh, a set of stimuli. But like I said, you might want to, you know, represent that whole set of rules as one entity that you can then cue from a context. In this case, the context, excuse me, C1 could be a color like orange that would tell you if the, if the context of the task is orange, then here's a set of mappings that you make. Uh, and then we'll just write that in shorthand of SI1 goes to AI1. And then maybe you might have to learn a different set of mappings for a different color. So that's like being in a different city in, in the driving example and so forth. Um, but like I said, in the, sit, in the driving example, you wouldn't wanna have to learn everything from scratch. You might, have, you might wanna actually abstract a set of task rules that allows you to say, okay, for all these different colors, which may be perceptually completely separate from each other, uh, so Montreal and Chicago don't look that similar, you might want to figure out, okay, I should link all those different contexts to the same underlying task set rule. And that's sort of like a latent thing that then points to the actual mappings between stimuli and actions. And maybe there are these other two contexts that get linked to a different task set rule. And so when you think about it this way, this is what you're really trying to learn, this latent task set space. It's latent because uh, you don't really see anything about this. You just have to have this sort of abstract pointer to the set of uh, uh, relationships. So it's, these would be like the driving rules and you'd say, okay, I'm in a kind of context that points to those set of driving rules. You could also think of this like a language, like if we're speak, speaking English or French, uh, when you're, when you're talking to someone and you recognize that they're speaking in English, you know that there's this abstract thing that is English that then means that the words you should produce for conveying a particular concept are something. Um, and a different person might point to that same English language and you should know immediately that you should use other words you know, to convey what you want in English. You don't have to like try out lots of different languages before you realize that you should speak to that person in English. But nevertheless, the the rule, in that case, the language is, is latent. Nobody's saying speak English, speak English, speak English. You just know that somebody's, you know, that they know English. Um, and so one of the things is, is that you have to be able to uh, decide what happens if you go to a new context, in this case, C7, this uh, purple color, and you have, you're not sure what to do. And so you could decide, okay, well, of all these different contexts I've seen in the past, there has been, in this example, two different rules. So let's say two different languages, English and French, or two different sets of driving rules. Uh, and so you could say, okay, well, what should I do? Well, maybe I will just assume that this context is the same as all of these ones. Or you could say, well, maybe I'll try out those ones. 
uh, and what we assume here in our in our models, and I'll, I'll show you some tests of this in a minute, is that we use what's called a Chinese restaurant process, which is a, a prior that just assumes that you are more likely to revisit rules, test sets that are more popular across test sets than other ones. So uh, your probability of trying out this test set should be essentially twice as good as high as the probability of trying out that one because this one is more popular than that one across contexts. Uh, and one thing that's sort of an, uh, important uh, for the assumptions here is that we're not just saying that this test set is more popular across experiences. It's not just how often you use this set of rules. It's how often the, it reappears across contexts, right? So if you're in one city that always has one set of driving rules and you're in that city almost all the time, um, that wouldn't necessarily be the one that you would reapply the most when you go to a new context, which rather the, if the set of driving rules, is con driving rules is common across multiple different cities, regardless of how many experiences you've had in each of those cities, that's what we're assuming is the, the popularity prior. Okay, so basically the idea here is that you should be more likely to reuse um, rules that are more popular across contexts, um, but you also have to allow for the possibility that when you're in that new context, that it doesn't, that none of the previous rules applied and that you might need to build a new set of rules altogether. So I don't know what it's like in, in Tehran in terms of the driving rules, it might be completely different or it might not be uh, from the rules in Montreal, Chicago and, and London. And so you have to allow for the possibility of doing that. Or similarly, you might wanna speak, uh, learn to speak a different language. <laughs> So the issue here is that uh, there are these latent task set spaces that help define the actions that you should make to different stimuli, uh, and it has unknown size. So we don't really know how many rule sets there are, how many different sets of driving rules there are, how many different languages there are. You just have to experience that uh, from the world and try out, uh, uh, try potentially to reuse different task sets, but also allow yourself to create new ones. And so this popularity prior, this Chinese restaurant process that I was referring to, allows you to have some parsimony where you're really trying to minimize that size by reusing things to the extent that you can and only creating a new one essentially when you have to. Um, and while I'm not gonna talk about this too much in uh, today's lecture, I just wanted to point out for those of you who are interested in these different uh, ways of reusing structures and, and generalizing and transfer, we have a new line of work with uh, Michael Littman's lab at Brown uh, that was published this past year on how you can do a, a yet more abstract version of, uh, of transfer. And just to, to give you a sense of that, uh, let's say you're, uh, if we're going to talk about it in terms of uh, instruments, so if you're learning to play guitar, that has a state action outcome association in the sense that you're playing different strings, they produce different notes uh, on different octaves. Um, and eventually you might want to figure out that there's some underlying abstraction here that you should be able to transfer to playing other instruments that have analogous state representations like the violin or the cello, which doesn't require you to reuse exactly the same task set. You don't reuse the same finger movements because you're using a, a, a bow and maybe the tuning is a bit different, but there are some abstractions in, in the state in terms of you know different, no, different uh, parts of the fretboard are similar to each other here. And that's also true here. There are certain rules that you want to preserve. Uh, and so we're, um, I, oops. Yeah, sorry. I, through this light in at the last minute and this was supposed to go away. Um, but uh, the general idea here is that it's basically, I'm just gonna go back a slide for a minute. It's the same thing as here in some sense, except that instead of what we're abstracting uh, being task set rules, which are literal mappings from states to actions, you can abstract uh, state abstractions, which are essentially equivalences in state spaces. So that some states are more equivalent to others. And you can realize that that structure applies in one context, and then you can compute a new optimal policy in a, in a separate context and reuse that. Um, that's a little bit vague here. I encourage you, if you're really interested in that, to ch check out this paper. It goes through it in much more detail. And it's something that we've only worked out at the computational level at this point, and we're trying to figure out whether uh, humans uh, use it later on. Okay, but I'll return to the, the main topic here. 
is that it turns out that uh, this sort of abstract, what it's a uh, CTS stands for context task set model, which is a Bayesian non-parametric model of reinforcement learning. Uh, it turns out that we can link some of its computations to the computations that you can get out of a neural network model of the biology of the prefrontal cortex and the basal ganglia in go involved in reinforcement learning. Uh, and they're not identical to each other, uh, but it turns out you can approximate the computational functions of this with a neural network model that just does reinforcement learning at multiple levels of the hierarchy. And, and for the details of that, I would suggest just checking out this paper here. Um, okay, so if you implement that, here is a, a cartoon diagram of that neural network. You have um, on the right side here is meant to be a sort of a circuit linking parts of the, the motor cortex of the brain where you're considering different motor actions that you might make with the basal ganglia, which is thought to involve, involve, be involved in reinforcement learning about learning which value, action values to select. Um, and so this right part of the circuit is uh, essentially what a lot of people study in sort of canonical reinforcement learning, simply learning which actions to select in response to which states. Uh, and what we've augmented the circuit to have here is a higher level where you're learning that there are some contexts in the world that indicate you should select not motor actions, but things like task sets. So more abstract actions um, where those are not predefined a priori. These are sort of units in a neural network model that don't mean anything initially, but they come to mean something by undergoing reinforcement learning where you can realize, okay, if I continue to use these sets of units in the prefrontal cortex in response to some context, then those units can provide uh, contextual modulators of the state action outcome mappings that you select in the lower level circuit. And you can use reinforcement learning through uh, dopamine like reward prediction errors that modify learning at both levels of these hierarchy at the same time in order to recognize that when you enter, when you re go to a new context, if that new context happens to, to indicate that you should reuse one of the previous test sets, you should be able to learn that through reinforcement learning and then transfer that in the lower level circuit. And so what, what this is showing here is that uh, if you're looking at a learning curve across uh, the number of trials that you experience for each input pattern, like a different state stimulus uh, that's presented in the network, that if the network has to reuse a task set that it's seen before, but in a completely new context, it learns much faster than when having to learn uh, a new task set from scratch. And that's because it figures out that it should just reuse the same abstract rule, even though the context features are completely different. Um, and this is just to show that while this is a, a, an abstract uh, cartoon diagram, each one of these circuits is implemented in a more biologically realistic model of the corticostriatal circuit that I'm not going to talk about. Okay, so. Um, uh, I'm now going to say how this can be applied to different sort of experimental task designs. So here is a task design that was uh, done by my colleague David Batter uh, at Brown. And what he did is he had human subjects do this uh, hierarchical learning task in which uh, people see uh, these shapes, uh, these colors and shapes and orientations. And there's a rule that the subject is not informed of because they have to do pure reinforcement learning in this task. That, uh, you know, when, it, when the subject sees a particular color and shape and orientation, they should press button one and that, that's how they're gonna get reward. They put, if they press button two or three, they won't get reward. Uh, but if they see this shape, um, they should press button two and this shape, they should press button three. The trick is that in this version of the task, it's hierarchical which means that if the color of the, of the screen is uh, red on the outside of the border, that means the only thing that matters to the subject to decide what reward they should get is shape. Orientation doesn't actually matter. So they should learn that they should um, abstract over orientations and only learn the uh, shape button associations in that task set. Whereas if the color is blue, they should ignore shape altogether. And the only thing that matters is orientation. So the orientation of this stimulus is like this. And that means they should press button one and here it's button two and here it's button three and so forth. Um, and so the subject is not 
told about any of these rules, they just get reinforcement for pressing the buttons for the different shapes and colors and orientations. Uh, and then we can compare that to the performance in a test that we'll call a flat task, where there is no underlying structure. They just have to learn, uh, you know, this color with this shape and orientation goes to button one, this one to button three, and so forth. Uh, and what you can see, this is just an example of a learning curve of a human subject in the flat task. You can see that their probability of getting it correct over hundreds of trials goes up. You know, they have to learn this for 18 different stimulus combinations, so it takes some time, um, but they do learn. Uh, but you can see that in the task where there's suddenly, um, there, there's a hierarchical structure to it, you suddenly see this much more rapid, uh, steep learning curve as if there's like a, an aha moment where they realize, oh, there's this structure here. I can just reuse the shape task set across all the different orientations in this case and reuse the orientation task set across all these different shapes in that case. And so if you're able to discover that structure, you're gonna learn faster here. Uh, and so uh, we showed that you can build one of these hierarchical neural network models that represents uh, you know, learning about re st stimulus response mappings on the motor side and, and uh, learns about these structures in more higher level hierarchies. I'm not gonna go into the details of that. Um, but what David showed was that people who are able to learn faster in the hierarchical context engaged a particular neural network in the brain that seemed to be uh, representing that, that level of hierarchical structure. So I'm just gonna very briefly summarize that here. Uh, what people generally see, I guess you can just look at the top for now uh, to start, is that when people are going through reinforcement learning, you can ask where in the brain do people represent reward prediction errors? So when rewards are better than expected in a reinforcement learning context. Uh, and when you do that, you tend to see very large regions of the striatum of the basal ganglia, they light up because they're getting these dopamine inputs that represent, uh, that are have been shown many times across species to represent reward prediction errors. So that really isn't new, but what is new is that if you're learning this more complex structure, we hypothesize that there will be particular circuits in the cortical striatal uh, circuit, sub-circuits that are representing this kind of hierarchical structure. And so David identified parts of the prefrontal cortex that he has studied in many times in the past that tends to represent this sort of second level hierarchical structure. And then he said, okay, well, which regions of the striatum are those connected to? And so there are these regions over here that are the same level of the uh, rostrocaudal hierarchy from the front to the back of the head as that part of the prefrontal cortex. And what I'm plotting here is the extent to which these reward prediction error signals are additionally boosted when the subject is paying attention to hierarchical structure as estimated from one of our computational models of this process. And so what this is showing is that these regions of the striatum show stronger reward prediction errors when people are attending to hierarchical structure, but not when they're attending to flat structure. And this is on the right side and the left side of the caudate nucleus. And if you move more posterior, so more to the back of the head than that, or more anterior than that, you don't see that extra modulation of the reward prediction error signal by attention to hierarchical structure. So what this is suggesting is that there's evidence of a particular network in the brain that's not just doing reinforcement learning overall with reward prediction errors, but that is uh, in attending to uh, sort of a certain higher level of hierarchical structure. And it, when it gets reinforcement for attending to that level of hierarchical structure, then people are more likely to uh, be able to perform well in this kind of task compared to that kind of task. And in many other studies, we've seen that that kind of uh, learning that kind of hierarchical structure does facilitate generalization and transfer. Okay, so I'm going to uh, uh, unpack a couple more uh, concrete examples of that in work by Ann Collins with me. So let's say uh, people have to learn uh, different in, a, in an initial training phase. They have different contexts. And in this case, the contexts are really just gonna be, let's say colors, but they could be anything. We, sometimes they're shapes or orientations or textures. Uh, and then for those contexts, they have to learn which action, A1 or A2, A3 or A4, to select in response to other states. So let's just stick with S stands for shape uh, and C stands for color. 
just convenience because this is also context and state or stimulus. And so what this would mean is you simply have to learn through reinforcement that you get reward that when you see state one, you should press A1. And when you see state two, you should press A2. And that that applies in C0. And it turns out that that also applies in C1. But that for C2, you have to learn a different set of mappings. Uh, and the subject is not instructed that there's anything special about colors versus shapes. They just have to realize that if they are going to represent this in a structured way, if they're going to represent it with C at sort of at the top, pointing to this latent tacit, that, uh, that they stand to benefit by transferring knowledge from this one to that one. And so this is a fairly trivial thing to learn, right? It's only six different context stimulus uh, combinations, and they get reinforcement. It's deterministic as to which ones they're rewarded. Uh, and so it's not really that interesting to see how well they learn in that initial phase. Uh, but the question is, if they've learned through this experience that rather than just learning the individual mappings of C, S, and A, if they learned that there's this structure, that this is a task set, so basically if they've learned that C0 should be equivalent to C1, even though they might look completely different, this could be red and that could be green, um, then once they've learned that equivalency, you can start adding in new shapes that they have to learn. So this would be, you know, this shape could be triangle and circle, but now suddenly you add diamond and square or something. And moreover, they also have to learn new action mappings. So this one, the, the mapping, the way in which these mappings, these actions go with these states is not related at all to, the, to these mappings. Um, so in this particular example, I've chosen A1 and A4, but it could be anything. Um, the only thing that we do is preserve the equivalence. So if it's A1 here, A1 and A4 here, it's also A1 and A4 here. And then again, here they have to learn new mappings, A3 and A2, which are not equivalent to those ones. And so this is a transfer phase in the sense that if they've learned the equivalence here, then anything they learn about um, new states in this context, they should immediately be able to transfer to this context. Uh, and this is the kind of thing where standard deep neural networks fail at even this basic kinds of transfer because uh, they involve completely new state representations and the neural networks just don't have those representations in which to map onto action outcome representations. But if you have a mechanism for learning this abstract structure in a latent kind of way, like we think humans do, you should be able to recognize that structure. So uh, to give you an example of how our models approach this problem and the kind of problem that we've done. So let's say you have these two different um, color contexts here. And if you structured it in this way that these two different color contexts point to the same uh, abstract uh, task set, then uh, you might have learned that A1 and A2 go to triangle and circle. Uh, and that you may have learned, and, th and that that applies for both, uh, you know, red and gray contexts. And you may have learned that A3 and A4 goes to triangle and circle for this color. And then the question is, what happens after you've learned that if you start adding in a diamond for which you don't know the correct action? Um, and so if there's this structure, we find that the model learns faster. You know, initially it's going to be a chance because it just doesn't know what action to select here but it's going to be faster at learning in this context compared to that context, simply because any knowledge it gets for red, it could immediately transfer to gray if the model knows that there's this underlying latent structure. Uh, and we see that in humans too. So this is human subjects performance that in, even from the very first trial for either of those contexts, as soon as they learn one of them, they can transfer it to the other one and they show that kind of uh, a transfer. Um, and that is not actually trivial because uh, if you look at what happened in the initial phase before they've learned this structure, you see that humans are actually worse at learning these initial mappings than they are at learning C2. And that's simply because uh, these ones are less, we, we control the, the frequency with which these are presented so that they're, each one of them is less frequent um, than that one so that the actual task sets are just as popular as each other. Um, and so the initial phase is actually less 
efficiently learned in the task set kind of way. Um, and you can replicate that in a model too, but um, that's kind of a, a detailed nuance. Okay, so that's showing one kind of transfer. Um, but what I haven't shown yet is whether subjects generalize these learned rules to new contexts. All I've shown is that they transfer uh, uh, within the existing context, they are able to add on new stimulus action mappings. But the question is, can they generalize to new contexts? So if we do, we've, if we've learned this kind of uh, structure, what happens if we start adding in new colors? And let's say this new color blue should point to that task set and the subjects don't know that, but they would have to learn that sh they should reuse that task set. And this color C4 or green, for that one, they would have to learn a new task set altogether. And so the model predicts that you know you should have a bias to try to reuse structures and you should be faster learning here than there. Um, but we can also test a more specific prediction is that C3, the one that is to be reused, um, it could point to the more popular task set or it could point to the less popular task set. Both of those have been uh, experienced before. And in fact, they've both been experienced to an equal frequency because this one is presented twice as often as that one. Um, but our model has this popularity prior, prior and suggests that people should be more likely to try out the one that's more popular across contexts. And so that's what this is meant to uh, show here is that the first transfer phase was saying, okay, this is the same test set, but it's different stimulus action mappings. Do you, can you, you know, transfer it uh, across the existing context? And here we're saying, well, what happens if you start adding in new contexts? And we can ask, are people more likely to learn uh, to transfer old tasks that, they, that they've seen before? Are they faster doing that compared to new ones altogether? And within that, we can ask, are they faster at learning the popular ones compared to the non-popular ones? And so that's what this uh, is meant to show. Uh, and we can show that in, in the model, uh, the model is faster at reusing the old task set compared to the new one. So that's basically the assumptions of the model using that popularity prior. Same thing is true in the neural network version. Uh, and you can see that that's true in people too, that they're more likely to, uh, they're, they're faster at learning that when they're seeing new contexts that they're going to reuse uh, when they have to reuse an old task set compared to learning a new one. Uh, uh, and yeah, I guess I'm not showing it here, but uh, I, I can't remember if I come back to this later, but we also saw that people were in fact, this kind of advantage was particularly prevalent when they had to reuse the popular one compared to the non-popular one. I think I will come back to that. Um, but we wanna be able to say, okay, is there evidence that their brains are structuring things in a hierarchical way um, that will allow them to do this kind of generalization? And so for that, we wanna look at a key quantity that comes from all reinforcement learning models is a prediction error. So the difference between the reward that you get and the expectation. And so I'm just gonna illustrate how we're gonna test this uh, by measuring brain met signals of, of prediction errors. Uh, so let's say you've learned these structures in the past um, and now suddenly you get this new diamond and it's orange and you don't know what to do because you have never experienced that before. So you just try out a new a button and let's say you try out button three and just by chance you happen to be correct. So you get reward. So the prediction error in this case would be big because you don't know the mapping for diamond. So you get a reward prediction error because you're happy and you get reward. Um, and then of course, if you see the, the orange diamond again, the next time and you get it correct, your prediction error should be smaller because your expectation is now that you, you should get, uh, that you've learned the sort of correct Q value, you've learned the, the action value of that stimulus. And so you should be not surprised. Um, okay, but now let's say you've learned, you experienced the red diamond and you press button one. Again, you haven't experienced that yet in the past. Uh, and if that's correct, again, you get a big prediction error. Uh, but then the key question is what happens after this, the very first time you see the gray diamond, you've never seen that before. And you, if, you've, uh, if you're representing this in a flat way, this is a new stimulus. And so if you're correct, you should also experience a big prediction error. On the other hand, if you're, experience, if you're learning it in this latent test set kind of way, you're not representing it as the gray color per se, but instead you're saying, well, I know gray points to this rule. And if I'm in that rule, I've just learned 
that that rule means press button one. And therefore, uh, if you're learning the structure, you should actually not be surprised when you get correct uh, feedback for this the very first time you see the gray uh, stimulus. So this is kind of like if you're representing uh, the language, you know, you see a new person and they're speaking English, you're not surprised that they're using an English word, a new English word, because you know that that's the structure that they're learning. Whereas a flat reinforcement learning model would still be surprised there. Okay, so what we do is we look at EEG signals. So these are brain uh, uh, event related potentials, voltage over people's scalps, over electrodes that have been studied many times in the past to relate to prediction errors and reinforcement learning. Uh, but instead of looking at it in a standard way, we're going to sort of plot the voltage across multiple different trials. And uh, what Ann Collins did here is she constructed a general linear model to evaluate the degree for each subject, the degree to which each of their electrodes is sensitive to the reward prediction error. So the, dis the degree to which the subject is surprised about their expectations as uh, we can get by fitting reinforcement learning models. And on top of that, we can ask, is there additional variance in the EEG signal that is sensitive to this structure prediction error, which is essentially the, what I described in the previous slide that you should be less surprised when, uh, specifically less surprised when outcomes are consistent with the structure. Um, and so uh, we can, we, what we find is that within this EEG signal, there are specific time points in which that EEG signal is particularly sensitive to reward prediction errors. And that's been shown in the past. So they, that's what these circles are, is that during this time period, people, the EEG signal is stronger when people experience prediction errors. And that was true, uh, and this is just a topography of uh, the voltage on the scalp at different moments in time in which uh, the brain signal is responsive to prediction errors. So there's one early at 108 milliseconds, that's here, and there's one later at around 350 milliseconds. Um, but that part is not super new. Like I said, there's lots of studies that have looked at prediction error responses in, in EEG signal. The question is how much additional variance is there that's sensitive to this structure prediction error? And we find that in both of these regions of interest, there's additional variance that's accounted for by that structure prediction error. So that's good because we have some neural marker of the extent to which people are, are sensitive to this structure. And the question is, does that predict uh, the, their ability to learn this structure behaviorally and, and to transfer it. And so what we found is, in fact, while some people show those structure prediction errors in their EEG signal, those are, these are the individual circles in black. This is the extent to which their EEG signals uh, show this structure prediction error. Other people in blue, on average, show pretty much no effect of structure prediction error, even though their brains are representing regular reward prediction errors. And so we can ask, are these people who are representing the structure in their surprise signals, are those the ones that are showing more benefit in terms of their generalization and transfer? And in fact, that, that is what we see. So this is if they are visiting a new context, C3, that points to an old task set, these people are faster to learn compared to when they have to learn a new task set from scratch. Whereas these people, it's not that they don't learn, they learn perfectly fine. They're just not showing any of that transfer that discriminates uh, you know, reusing an old task set from a new one. So that suggests that this EEG signal of structure learning and prediction errors is indicative of people's tendency to represent things in this sort of latent uh, kind of way that they can then reuse across contexts. Uh, and then I, I think I don't wanna to spend too much time on this, but I, I already alluded to before that if that new task set is popular compared to unpopular, um, people are more likely to try out the more popular action, from the more popular task set compared to the less popular task set. And that is especially true, again, of those subjects who have this structure prediction error. So uh, just to summarize that, if your brain is representing surprise in a way that's consistent with learning structure, you're more likely to reuse structure and you're more likely to do so in a way that emphasizes the popularity when you're uh, visiting a new context in the very first trial. So uh, just a summary of all that is that this kind of structure learning affords transfer. People are faster at reusing uh, task sets uh, and learning new state action associations uh, in existing contexts. It depends on these cluster of priors and it informs these neural representations of reward prediction errors. Um, 
And then if we plot it, if I just summarize it according to this sort of uh, table here, um, what's interesting is that we saw no benefit of structure learning during the early phase in the initial learning itself that allows you to establish the structure. And that's analogous to what I was talking about as children, when you're learning from scratch at the beginning, there is actually no benefit of having structure learning. In fact, it's costly, you're slower than if you're using structure learning uh, compared to if you just learned it in a flat way. And we see that in our models too. But once you've built that structure, it affords new transfer of new information within existing learned clusters. That was the first transfer phase. And it also affords transfer of known rules to new contexts with a kind of popularity popularity clustering prior. Um, and so if, if you're curious about some more of the details of this, you can look at these sort of neural signatures of hierarchical prediction errors in fMRI and EEG in, in these papers. Okay, let me just see how I'm doing for time. Seems okay. Uh, and also very briefly, Denise Wurchin and Dima Amso at Brown uh, applied this kind of uh, hierarchical task set learning to infants where infants are not having to play on a computer and press buttons, of course, uh, but we looked at the degree to which they're surprised when they're learning uh, new uh, hierarchical associations in language learning. And uh, we found uh, very briefly that humans, uh, that infants actually were representing things in a hierarchical generalizable way, even though, um, even though they're infants, just a few eight months years, uh, eight months old, and the degree to which they did that was related to activity in their uh, prefrontal cortex. Okay, so in the remainder of my talk, I just wanna uh, motivate a somewhat different aspect of this. So, so far, I, what I've emphasized is the benefits of transferring structures of learned task sets. Um, but of course, there's lots of things we haven't addressed. So one of the things that we've started to look at is this kind of problem where let's say you're a kid and you're learning an instrument, like you're playing the piano, uh, but then you also learn uh, to play the guitar. So these are different kind of uh, rule sets. Um, the guitar and the piano share some things, right? They share maybe the chord progression of the song that you're trying to play, the rhythm, the desired sound in the song. Um, but then maybe, maybe you learn the flute and the saxophone and those things, are two different instruments, but they tend to share other, th other things like the physical movements of uh, the mappings that go from sounds to notes. So the, the actual finger movements that you have to do in the flute, some of those can actually transfer to the saxophone. But that's a separate kind of thing that you might wanna transfer than the song that you want to play. And so uh, if, you, if you're a musician who's experienced and played a bunch of different uh, instruments in the past, what if you're given a new instrument you've never played before, like a piccolo? Uh, in that case, it has finger movements that overlap with a flute. But maybe you want to use it to play a song that you've learned on the guitar. And everything I've told you about today in terms of reusing task sets would not really allow you to do that because a task set is, is sort of combines the state, action, and outcome. In, in, the outcome is like the reward function of what you want to learn. And then the mappings of like finger movements to particular notes is the transition function of how you get there. And it, it, the task set sort of uh, framework combines all of that into one. And so, but what we really need is what we would refer to as compositionality. So the ability to reuse flute mappings to play a song that's usually played on guitar. And so this is work by uh, Nick Franklin, who did this uh, both in computational simulations and uh, in human experiments that I'll briefly unpack for you, um, where you can think about uh, in the kinds of, uh, uh, for the instrument case, the reward function would be like, what do you want to do? Like, what song do you want to play? Uh, and the transition function would be, how can you do it? And the task set framework assumes that you're essentially, what we're clustering, what we're putting together into a latent state is the rewards and transitions together. And so if you cluster both of them jointly, that will not allow you to generalize each independent of the other. Um, and so on the right here is essentially what we were doing with the task set work, joint clustering. We were taking these contexts and trying to sort of put them into bins of how different colors go together to then define the, um, 
the transition function and the reward function, which then determines the policy. Um, but what Nick introduced here is the possibility of doing this clustering in a more independent way, meaning you can take, take each context and you can uh, cluster uh, the transition function independently from the reward function. So it may be that you take you know, the green and the uh, blue context and those point to the same transition function, but in terms of reward functions, green and blue might go together in a different bin. And that's Nick, this is his work here. And so what he applied this to is not only um, you know, very simple task sets where you have single stimuli and actions and outcomes, uh, but more uh, temporally extended sequential decision-making in a model-based uh, context. Um, and so the reward functions here are, let's, if you're in this grid world, let's say you're this little agent here and you're trying to figure out how to move around to get a reward, the reward functions are, well, there are these different x, y coordinates in the grid, and one of them has a reward value and the other ones don't, or you, know, you could add rewards or penalties anywhere. Um, but then the transition function is, given you're here, which actions should you take in order to move north, east, west, or south? And in some grid worlds, it might be that you have to you know, use certain buttons on a keyboard if you're a human, or if you're a, an AI agent, you have different abstract actions, and other ones, it might be something else. All right, so the, the set here, that's the setup. You have to learn both rewards and transition functions. Uh, and you, even though we're, you're doing this in terms of grid worlds, you can think about this in terms of the guitar example in the sense that, uh, you know, in the guitar example, you're having to figure out which frets and, and strings to play in order to produce which notes. That's like which actions to produce in order to produce which uh, cardinal directions here. Um, and so in order to test the benefits of structuring things in an independent or joint way in this sort of structure learning, uh, we ran a bunch of simulations. The one that I'm gonna show you here, is, uh, is an extension of what's often referred to as the rooms problem in RL, where you're an agent and you have to figure out how to get to a door and then that then takes you to another room that you have to go to another door and then another door and finally go to the end. So these are like sub goals that take you to a goal in the end. Uh, and you can think of each new room as a new context, sort of like a new color um, and uh, and what we structured it such that there are different transitions in each room. So sometimes you have to you know, use these action mappings to move around and sometimes you have to use those action mappings and so forth. Uh, and there's also different doors in each room. And so you have to figure out which is the right door to go to to get to the next room. Uh, and then we made it uh, diabolical, which is, means it's, it's particularly difficult in the sense that if in any one of these rooms, if you go to the wrong door, you actually have to go back to the start. So even if you get to the third room here, if you forget, if you don't know which door to go to to get to the overall goal, if you go to another door, it's gonna take you back to the beginning of the entire thing. So that really pressures the system to be able to learn uh, how to combine transition functions and reward functions in a way that allows you to reuse knowledge from previous rooms and, uh, and to do that properly. Uh, and so what Nick finds is that if you make it such that you know, the transition functions and reward functions are independent of each other in the actual task, then there's a, a big benefit to structuring things independently uh, that the agent is much faster at learning to go through, the, go through this kind of maze using independent structuring compared to joint clustering. Um, and I'm showing that that's shown over here on average, but here it's also showing that as you increase the number of rooms that it has to learn, that advantage grows in terms of the cumulative steps taken where the independent agent is uh, you know, much faster than the joint clustering agent, which suggests there's an advantage to clustering things uh, compositionally. And that advantage grows with both the number of rooms and it also grows with the size of the grid. So here I was showing it as if it's five by five, which would be 25, but that advantage also grows as you make the grids bigger. Okay. Um, so in brief, joint clustering makes it so that you're, you're consider, you always consider the transitions when you're generalizing the goals. So that's like, you know, uh, playing a note on the guitar and assuming it tells you what song you want to play. Uh, whereas independent clustering allows you to generalize the goals independent of the transitions, 
So you're essentially like learning ab about the marginal distributions. Um, and so this, the joint clustering model is actually a more complex model. And the independent clustering model is less complex in a sort of statistical way. And they differentially trade off bias and variance. So joint clustering is actually better asymptotically. Eventually, if you want to have joint clustering, if you have enough data, you can learn anything. Um, but independent clustering gives you sort of a, a prior to be more robust to noise. And that's what this paper shows is that sometimes it's better to be independent, sometimes it's better to be joint, um, but it's actually good to have a prior to assume that the world is structured in an independent way. And since I only have a few more minutes, I just wanna be able to just say that, uh, well, I, one thing is that I wanted to follow up on that. I was not claiming that it's always better to, to structure things independently, but rather we have this sort of meta agent that can learn based on the statistics of the environment should I use a joint structure or should I use an independent one? And I can differentially weight that depending on the evidence for that structure in the environment. Uh, and then I can show that, you know, there are some environments that are structured in a joint way where the joint model does better, uh, or sorry, the independent model does better. And some models where the, the rewards and transitions are joint, where the joint model does better. And you, if you have this meta agent that could sort of generalize to generalize, it figures out is the structure of the environment as a whole even as you go to new contexts, is it joint or is it independent? That meta agent can do better in both contexts. And the gist of it is that when we test human subjects on this, where we give them grid worlds that look just like what I was showing uh, in subjects in the, in the simulations, that human subjects look a lot like this meta agent. They can figure out when to be independent and when to be joint. And so we still need to understand you know, exactly how they do that and how their brain does that, but that's, uh, topic for ongoing studies. Okay, so I'm gonna, sorry, just skip the rest of this. It was just more statistical arguments about this. And I was showing how uh, human, the evidence that humans do this. Again, if you're interested in the details of the human study, you can refer to this 2020 paper where we show that humans look like that meta agent in their generalization. Uh, and now I just wanna close so that we have enough time for questions. And so I'm gonna give the summary, which is uh, we think that learning Reinforcement learning is not just learning per se, but it involves decision-making at multiple levels of hierarchical structure. So you have to learn, you know, what is the task structure? What you're, you're selecting, not just the action at the end of the day, you're selecting some abstraction of what is the task structure that you're in, the task set, and maybe even an, a meta task set of whether you should structure things in an independent way or a joint way. Uh, and we think that these hierarchical interactions between the prefrontal cortex and the basal ganglia support this kind of structure learning. Um, and we've shown that our, in our neural network models that have this hierarchical structure, those are actually slower to acquire action contingencies in the first place compared to a flat model that has just one level. Because that hierarchical model has to learn the world structure, it has to learn like which Con which stimuli in the world are context and which are states and it has to do credit assignment and it has to learn that simultaneously with actions. So it's actually inefficient, just like the kids are. But once you've built that structure up, it affords generalization of, and transfer and massive wild speculation that that might have a role in development. Uh, and finally, uh, we argue that compositional clustering is normative. So with that, I just wanna say thank you for inviting me here. Uh, and thank you especially to Ann Collins, who did much of uh, the initial work on task set clustering, and to Nick Franklin for that later work, uh, my other collaborators, and my lab. And thank you. Thanks so many thanks for your great presentation. Uh, it was very interesting. Uh, okay, everyone, any questions? Yes, Hussein. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Frank, I yes. have a question about the section that you told about instrumental learning. Uh -huh. uh, in my mind, I think about that, and uh, briefly, I told you, uh, I will be happy if you correct me. I think uh, when the person uh, trying to learn something, for example, a guitar or flute or other instrument, um, they won't learn how to in a transform semantic or metaphoric uh, structure in their own mind. And in the next step, um, he learned how to transmit 
this data using uh, by simulator uh, for the next step. For example, you told someone learn how to play piano. Basically, he learned how to um, hear, for example, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, and etc. And in the next step, he learned how to play, for example, violin or another instrument. Just he learned uh, how to play, for example, new instrument, but he doesn't, he doesn't necessary to learn how to uh, play uh, and hear uh, notes or another structures. I think um, in this structure that you have explained for us, um, in the first step, we learn semantic and um, metaphoric structure. And the next step, just a stimulator um, uh, ignited, money, uh, ignited this learning for the next step. I will be happy if you correct me. Thanks. Um, yeah, if I understand correctly, I, I think I, I fully agree. So the um, I alluded to this this new work on state abstraction, um, where um, what you really would like to to do because I, I think this this work on compositional uh, clustering or, or abstraction and transfer when you're combining uh, information that you learned from the guitar with information that you learned from the flute. Um, I, I think it does take a step forward beyond what we had done before on joint uh, uh, transfer with task sets. But really all it allows you to do is uh, say, okay, I could reuse this specific finger mapping from one instrument to play this song on another instrument, which is great. But if you're actually switching from a guitar to a violin, then uh, there's no, there's nothing about. Maybe you've never played a violin before. You've never played anything with a bow, right? Um, and so there's no transition function really that you could reuse exactly. Nevertheless, we think that people will learn the semantics, as you call it, um, because uh, they will abstract instead of learning the literal transition functions. They will learn that there are some parts of the fretboard that are similar to other parts of the fretboard in terms of the sounds that they make, and that that is the, the, the similarity relationship. And it's that abstract structure that they're learning first. Uh, and that's what we call state abstraction. And it's that that they could reuse later on, not the literal transition function. Um, and so we have some initial work to that extent, to, to that effect, including in a, a simulated guitar playing task where you can train an agent to play uh, a particular scale, like let's say a, an A scale where you play uh, C, D, G, A, B, or whatever the scale is on a, on, a, on a guitar. And so the agent has to learn that too on this fretboard. It has to figure out, okay, it only gets reward every time it selects the right note in that scale in the right sequence. But because the fretboard has many different positions, there's lots of different places where you can play that scale. And so if you learn that there's equivalencies, that you know, the C note is here and it, you know, it's one part of this fretboard and it's also somewhere else and also somewhere else, you're learning that, that that's the structure that you know, all these different things co correspond to C and all these other ones correspond to D and so forth. Now, if you suddenly have to play a new scale, even on the same instrument, just on the guitar again, if you want to switch from the, the C scale to a, a, a G scale or whatever, um, if you learned that abstraction of how things are related to each other, you could uh, learn much faster than, uh, than really just uh, trying to literally uh, transfer the transition function because the policy is completely different from one scale to another. And so the transition function doesn't itself uh, it isn't useful to, to reuse. What is, what is useful to reuse is the, the state abstraction. So we've done a little bit of work on that, but we still have to, um, and, and you know, you can look at the 2020 paper for that if you're interested, but we still haven't really applied it in the more, um, you know, to really go across something like different instruments. Uh, and also there's lots of open questions about how humans actually do that. So we're really just trying to, you know, define this into relatively small problems that we can get traction on with, computational simulations and we can do experiments in the lab or online with grid worlds and so forth. Uh, and then, you know, we use this instrument kind of stuff for a way of motivating the overall problem that we want to get to eventually. I hope that provides somewhat of an answer to your question. Thanks.
Uh, hello. Hi there. Uh, thank you for your lecture. Uh, it was really, really uh, astonishing and, you know, effective for me particularly because, you know, uh, I never thought in this way, but I have uh, many questions, but I have to uh, diminish them. I'm, I have mainly two questions. First is, uh, is those task sets uh, or abstract, uh, you know, place are just suggested they are is there any you know, neural basis for those uh you know states or just say oh uh, you know f mathematical functions that provides us to clarify what's going on and uh the second please answer the first question because the second is related okay um well so i think there's a pretty good evidence for this phenomenon of task sets in cognitive psychology you know in the sense of there are many experiments that suggest that people use test sets in different ways, even without looking into the brain. In terms of the brain, um, I think we have some evidence that, so uh, I, pre I presented some of that in the sense that you see these hierarchical prediction errors that should only occur if you're representing things in terms of these latent test set structures. But what we didn't show in those studies is that we couldn't really like, decode the test set itself. like. The, the actual contingency map between different states and actions as, as an abstract entity. Um, th there are some evidence in monkey neurophysiology that you could see these sort of rule-like neurons in the prefrontal cortex. So the neurons seem to represent the mappings between states, actions, and outcomes. But those have not, I, I wouldn't say they've been fully tested in the way that is abs as abstract as we would like to see. Um, but yeah, there's a number of neuroscience studies that would be consistent with this. I, I, I would hesitate to say that we absolutely know for certain that that's exactly how it works. Uh, does it mean that it might be, you know, not conscious, but they are some sort of a place that, that in the higher dimension of our conscious experience or awareness that, you know, uh, reduce to so something like a place of prob probabilities and it's reduced to something that we know, and 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 the higher dimension is actually those abstract, abstract place. I mean, uh, we don't actually knew what is this, but we know that it affects. But does it make make it that uh, you know can be inferenced that uh, that might be uh, some some sort of uh, you know unconscious or paraconscious experiences, and uh, and does it relate to any and does this abstract place has any sort of logic that we use in our daily life? I mean, um, uh, how we can formulate those abstract, uh, you know, places or, or um, you know, in particular. Um, yeah, I'm not so sure I that I get it. <laughs> I'm not sure that I, you know, I, I can transfer it correctly, but um, I mean, uh, those, uh, you know, abstract places are, are vague to me. I, I'm not sure. It, it doesn't clarify to me, you know. Well, just... well let, let me try and tell me. I mean, I, I, guess, I, I, don't, I don't think I will have a good answer to you because I think if you're asking about conscious awareness, I find it, it's always very hard to study that because it was well, hard from the scientific perspective to, to say, you know, what's the basis of the actual phenomenology of what it feels like to be conscious of something. But also, even if you ask somebody, were you aware of this set of relationships? Um, we've I've found in the past, and there's a literature on this. But if you ask people with like questionnaires, they're they're usually pretty bad at telling you what they really do have awareness of, or they they'll say they're aware of something, but they really are acting in in a different way. So it's just hard to study. Um, but uh, subjectively, let's say we think about the test sets as. Um, a language. I, I, there's so many, so many different examples, but lang language is one of them, right? So when you're talking English, as you are uh, now, then um, you're not constantly thinking, okay, I'm talking English, talking English, talking English. You just get exactly. into that task set, which then conditionalizes this. There's sort of the ways in which you try to convey um, uh, w concepts into words, and you're, you're probably not translating every word that you're generating from your native language to English uh, when you're speaking to me, right? You're, you're already in that test set. If I were to ask you, what language are you speaking? Of course, you would become aware that you're speaking English and you would be able to, to report that. But 
how, I mean, I think it's a really great question to think about how that arises in the first place. In our neural network models, those tests that like units just arise through a lot of reinforcement learning and they come to represent these abstract quantities. They don't, they're not instructed. Actually, actually when I'm speaking with you in English, uh, at, at any time, there is some sort of a feedback that is positive that I'm doing the right thing to continue speaking this language. Does it mean that the task set is just uh, the sets of these positive feedbacks? Does it mean it? I mean, uh, you know, you know, uh, some sort of theories that, that suggest the consciousness is actually uh, those feedbacks that maybe not, you know, uh, real. And I'm saying that those abstract places and those, uh, you know, task sets might be uh, those positive, uh, you know, feedbacks, because I know that I'm speaking English and you keep doing the, t the same thing. While, uh, once I finish uh, speaking English, like, salam you, you won't understand because those, in fact, those, uh, you know, feedbacks uh, cease to exist. And, and, and you shift those, uh, you know, uh, task sets. I, 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 I like to know that I, I like to be sure about that, uh, you know, um, uh, representation. Well, I mean, if I understand correctly, I, I, I think I, I agree in the sense that, uh, so if you were not sure what language I spoke and then you started speaking English to me and then I, you, I conveyed that I understood what you were saying, that would give you positive feedback exactly. that would cause you to continue to use language, uh, English. But if, if suddenly I said something that had an, a French accent or something, you, you might switch and select a different test set. And uh, if you know French, then you could try that. If you don't know French, then you would have to, um, you know, try out a different strategy altogether. But that's, exa that's exactly what uh, we're saying in these hierarchical models, right, is that you're using basic aspects of reinforcement learning when things are better than expected, not just for the individual actions that you're taking or the individual words that you're speaking in this case, but for the high level structure of what applies in this context. And that in that case, the high level structure is uh, a language and the context is the person you're speaking to. But in like an instrument, it might be, uh, you know, I'm playing an instrument that has this particular tuning, E, A, D, G, B or whatever. Exactly. Or, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I know your, you know, uh, your presentation on, on an instrument. I am I'm completely agree because, uh, you know, once we follow the harmony and, uh, you know, um, uh, counterpoints, which are, you know, actual kind of, abstract uh, grammar of, of, uh, of singings. And, and there are many other facts and you know, effects on our uh, uh, playing. And thank you so much for your answer. It was super cool. Thank you for the question. Great question. Okay, I think Arash has a, a question. Arash, please. Yes. Uh, first, thank you for your wonderful presentation. It was very informative. Uh, my question, uh, unfortunately, I'm not sure you asked, uh, you mentioned this or not. I have a very bad connection uh, today. Uh, I split my question in two parts. First, uh, you mentioned that uh, when we face a new context, uh, we have two options. Use the old, uh, our old context and their ta task set or uh, build a new context with new task sets. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, yes. Um, I, I, my question is, when we face a new context, and we see that one of our old contexts, uh, tasks it, it can be applied to this new context, around 60% of 70% are uh, suitable for this new context. Uh, it might be optimal that we uh, use this context with some changes in task set uh, instead of being uh, building a new context, it, we can do this. Or uh, we can do this or not? Uh, is this first part? Uh, oh, um, so let me make, make sure I understand what you're saying. Are you saying that if you go to a new context, that you might not have to reuse the entire task set, but little bits and pieces of the task set, but not? Uh, uh, yes, I, I mean uh, we can modify the task tasks it a little bit instead of building a new context entirely. Can we oh. do this or something? Yes. No, yeah, that's a great question. So I think that that relates to this notion of compositionality, where the way we, we address the compositionality is that you shouldn't have to build a new task set altogether if, if you can just recombine 
the transition functions with reward functions. But I think what you're talking about is a somewhat different kind of compositionality where the transition function itself, for example, um, it might be that some aspects of a previous test set uh, apply, but other ones you have to modify. And maybe you wanna be compositional in that where, so an example would be if you learn to drive in a car on the right side of the road and you go to a different city where you have to drive on the left side of the road, you don't have to relearn all of the different movements in order to drive properly. Some of them you have to relearn because you're using your left hand to shift in instead of your right hand and, and so forth. Uh, but you can recombine stuff that you've learned about shifting uh, with stuff that you've learned and, and, and still maintain a lot of the, the existing test sets. Um, and that's, that's one of the things that we would like to uh, augment our models to have. There's a little bit of work that others have done uh, on that, but uh, it's a good point. Uh, thank you. Uh, my second part of the question was building on that. Uh, if uh, there is a par parameter for being uh, to reach an optimal point for this, but you say it, you, uh, you have to research more. Thank you. That uh, my second question is uh, in your in the slides you show us that one level of abstraction can we have uh, two or three level of abstractions uh, that lead to I don't know. I, I have three level of abstraction, then I get to the task. So do we have some, something like this? I think so, yeah. I think um, so that that newer work that I didn't have time to talk about, but I, I mentioned it very quickly, is just a paper that came out with uh, Lucas Lehnert. So that is basically how uh, you, it, you're not just learning the test set, the, the policy of how to move to get rewards, but you're learning um, uh, in a more abstract way, which states are uh, more similar to other, are similar to other states. Uh, so essentially, if you want to learn to compress uh, a Markov decision process into the minimally the minimal size, and then reuse that in another context, in terms of the same, you know, like topology of the state space, but everything else could be different. The transition functions could be different. The reward functions could be different. But the ways in which two states are equivalent to each other in one context may be the same in another context. And so that's a, yet a higher level of abstraction. I guess it falls under the, the domain of state abstraction in reinforcement learning. Um, and uh, we, you know, we have some models that really come from the computer science side of things about how to do that. And we're still trying to figure out how humans might do that. Um, and one of the things that I'm, particularly really interested in recently is uh, the role of replay. So I, I'm not sure if you've covered replay, but in, uh, in both computer science and in the brain, you see that when people or animals are learning uh, to navigate in some world, during offline afterwards, you see that some patterns that they experienced during learning are replayed or revisited. And it's thought that that allows you to sort of ingrain learning of some kind of reinforcement learning structure. Uh, and so what we're interested in is whether that replay, instead of just just allowing you to relearn very specific state action outcome mappings, it may allow you to more, uh, may allow you to realize that some states are actually similar to other states and that you should abstract over those and, and collapse them together. And that after sleeping, you might actually be develop a little bit more insight and be able to do that kind of more abstract uh, transfer. That's one of the things that we're, we're studying now. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Sadel, I think you have many questions. Please feel free to ask. Thank you for, uh, thank you for your interesting lecture. I have some question about <clears throat> your presentation. Uh, which area of, uh, of cortex are are involved in learning from feedbacks? Uh, which way area of cortex? Um, so yes. uh, there are a lot of areas. I mean, the orbit or frontal cortex, which is like the, you know, just above the eyes and in the front, uh, that area seems to be involved in reward processing generally. And it's debated as to, and certainly there are, uh, there are studies that show that you get 
reward prediction error responses. So when feedback is positive or negative, the difference from that expectation you see conveyed in mostly or most well studied in the dopamine neurons in the brain, but those project to parts of the cortex that then use those uh, feedback, uh, um, those neural representations of feedback to link them to maybe some of these more abstract states. So I would say the orbital frontal cortex, but also the, the dorsal medial frontal cortex, the, like the anterior cingulate cortex seems to be very important for error representing errors and learning from feedback. Um, but that both of those also interact very heavily with the whole basal ganglia circuit that I briefly mentioned where there's uh, you know, a whole subcortical circuit that links from the striatum to the thalamus and back to the cortex. So I, I wouldn't say that it's really one region, it's a whole set of networks. Okay, uh, which oscillation in this area reflect this learning, uh, for example, you refer to F, uh, FRN in FCZ as a reward yeah. prediction error si signal, yes? Yeah, that's right. And it, it, at the level of oscillation, it seems to be in the theta band and the delta band. So fairly low frequency oscillations at, a, at between, let's say, two and five hertz. Does that help? Yes, yes, yes. I have another question. Uh, so don't, uh, don't modulate uh, this, uh, this oscillation cause a change in learning from feedbacks? Uh, th does the, the change, does the modulate, sorry, can you ask that question again? Don't modulate this oscillation of the change in learning from feedback? Um, so, I mean, there, there's some evidence that changes in the, the power in these theta band signals during reward prediction errors are related in, in, to the de degree to which people learn from reward prediction errors from, from these feedback. Um, so there's some correlational evidence that yes, that's true, but um, it's a little bit harder to say causally in, in humans. Um, Let's see, there, I guess there's a little bit in, in, in rodent literature, there, there was a little bit of studies that showed that these oscillations are related to adjustment, uh, learning from feedback. So I guess, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, for example, my, if I, I want to put my mind to the board, uh, for example, if we cause a visual lesion in uh, those area like MT by TMS, Will there, be, uh, will there be a difference in learning chart? Did I get it right? If you, if you uh, lesion those parts of the brain, yeah, I would say that yes, there would be a difference in learning. Okay, okay thank you, thank you. And I have, a, I have another question. Okay. Given, uh, given the past failure to change the learning by a stimulation method, what stimulation method do you suggest to change participant performance in instrumental learning context? Thank you. Um, what stimulation method? So do you mean uh, external stimulation like transcranial magnetic stimulation or something like that? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, well, that's difficult because um, I, I mean, I've played around with that a little bit in my lab with uh, actually transcranial alternating current simulation. So trying to uh, change people's theta band oscillations by st stimulating uh, in the theta frequency electrically. Um, and that sent me down a long rabbit hole of, I, I thought I was, I, I was, I was trying to improve performance on a task and I kept impairing performance. It made it, the subjects would get worse rather than better because it's much easier to interfere with endogenous brain signals than it is to enhance them. Um, and uh, I, I think it is possible. I just, I don't know if I would uh, say that there's a very clear answer of how to do that properly. We're working a little bit with, uh, with patients with uh, Parkinson's disease who have deep brain stimulation. So electrodes that are implanted in the basal ganglia uh, with uh, Wael Assad, who's a neurosurgeon here. And, um, and there we actually are trying to do, because th there is some studies on, on mice, if you can get very precise control of 
the specific neurons in the basal ganglia, you can enhance learning from feedback. Um, but that's much more precise and invasive than what we can do in humans. Um, but with this deep brain stimulation, we're trying to see if we can do something similar uh, electrically. Um, and I guess I will let you know if it works. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Any other question, everybody? May I ask, please ask your question. Uh, hello there, thank you for your interactive lecture. That was amazing to me. I just have a question. Um, can we understand someone shows fake feedback or reactions to our actions? For example, uh, if we have a patient uh, by actual cognitive psychology, can we rec recognize that um, they shows us a f um, actually a fake feedback? For example, um, they are sad, but they pretending happy or something like that by uh, image processing or brain neural processing or EEG or something. Um, so you're saying if you give people feedback that is fake, will they learn in the wrong way? Or oh, sorry, I, I didn't get the premise of the question. Uh, I've, I mean, their feedback different with their um, real actually senses. Uh, I mean, they're, they would be sad, but they're pretending happy in their face. Uh, can we recognize their uh, actually real senses with their neural or um, EEG or something? Oh, oh. okay. So you, you want to know if, if somebody has a facial expression that looks like they're happy, but they're really sad, could we tell that from looking at their brain? Is that the question? Yeah, really. I see. Uh, yeah, I think that's possible. Um, the, the difficulty, so I, I think somehow you'd have to, there are ways to do that in a, in a data-driven way, right? So you, you, if you do machine learning and you try to say, okay, here's what the brain state looks like when somebody is happy versus sad. Um, now you can try to apply that in the case where their face looks different than that. But then you have to, you have to have some data to tell you when they actually feel happy in the first place that you believe in order to create that classifier. And, and one way of doing that might be to use other subjects to the extent that everybody has some overall similar brain state when they feel overall happy. Then maybe you could apply that to, you know, what you learn from other subjects to one subject who's sort of faking it on their face. Um, or maybe you mean, um, yeah, so another possibility is to use a more theory-driven approach like these reward prediction errors. We, th there's actually, there is some research that um, if you just ask people how happy they are when they're doing some gambling task where they're trying to win money and so forth, um, that the way you could predict their happiness is from their history sure. of, of uh, reward prediction errors and not from like, if they're winning money, it's not just from how much money they get, it's how much they were surprised, how much better than expected. Uh, and so the more they have reward prediction errors, the happier they are. And so since we know that there are very good neural representations of reward prediction errors, you can try to decode that from their brain using these EEG signals or fMRI. And if, uh, so if they're expressing a happy face, but their brain is saying that they're not experiencing a big reward prediction error, you might be able to conclude that they're not actually experiencing happiness at that point. Thanks a lot. Okay, Michael, uh, we have another question from one of the participants in the chat. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't see the, where is the chat? Oh, there. Okay. Do cortical areas play an independent role in learning or are they just reflection of mesen, mesencephalon system? Um, I think they play an independent role. The cortex plays an independent role in learning in the sense that they augment the kind of... So um, animals that have no cortex are able to learn for sure. But once you have a cortex, you can do these kind of state abstractions that I'm talking about, like recognizing the semantics of how similar one thing is to another. And that allows you to make these kinds of transformations that then allow you to learn faster. Oh, okay. 
my God, the answer, <laughs> the feedback. Yeah, so I, I think that the cortex allows you to learn faster and in a more flexible way that allows you to transfer. Okay, the last question uh, is from Helia. Helia, ask your question, please. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, hello, and uh, thanks for um, everything. I just wanted to ask a question about uh, manipulation, like uh, the last person asked. Uh, can we manipulate uh, these uh, results, uh, like uh, we manipulate the device that um, we have for uh, figure out either somebody is lying or not. You know what I mean? Uh, we can manipulate we, our heart rate. We can change uh, how we, uh, I don't know, do everything to show uh, everybody that we are uh, lying or not uh, and um, somehow uh, manipulate uh, all the results. Uh, can we do that with our brain EPG or something? Uh, I mean, there's there's a lot of research on trying to get good lie detectors from neural activity. Uh, I think a lot of them are, uh, I, I'm not, to be honest, I'm not up to speed on the recent work on that, but I, my, my sense from the past is that a lot of them claim to work when they actually don't work. Um, in principle, I think it's possible. I mean, that's what the lie detectors are supposed to be for, you know, just for, Rep representing your skin conductance or something. Um, but uh, that's not, I, I guess I'd say it's just not my area of expertise on an exactly lie detection. I think you maybe you could use some of these, this research on reward prediction errors if you can figure out a clever way of uh, presenting some stimulus to somebody that their brain should feel better than expected when you say something and if it's different, it may be similar to the, the previous question. If their face is saying one thing, you could ask whether their brain is feeling something different. If you could somehow figure out to present things in a either rewarding or punishing context that would indicate that things were better or worse than expected in a way that would tell you that that means it was a lie, maybe that could work, but uh, don't know. <laughs> Okay, Sadak, do you have another question? Yes, yes. Please. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, can we modulate learning performance by modulate cognitive control network? Seems like Kavana introduced it. Uh, yeah, I think so. So um, in the 2013 paper from Ann Collins on the top right here, that was the, the model of uh, hierarchical learning, right? So where you have you know one level where you have to learn this abstract test structure and another level where you have to figure out what action to select given the test structure. In that paper, we also talk about cognitive control because um, in order to allow, for the, for the model to learn efficiently, you have to not respond too quickly in response to a stimulus. You don't wanna just do your prepotent strongest action that comes to mind, but rather you wanna wait and decide what is the correct uh, task stru structure first. And so we think that you use, in our models, there's a cognitive, cognitive control process there which detects conflict between your initial uh, prepotent action about like what your, your uh, you know, like reflection, reflex action would be. And the fact that you're not sure what context you're in or what rule to apply. And if you detect that conflict, you can use cognitive control to suppress your motor system from responding too quickly and allowing it to wait until you're sure about what the high level structure is. And then, uh, and then if you do that, you are more likely to respond correctly. And you're also more likely to learn uh, to apply whatever feedback you get to the correct uh, structure. So like if you, if you respond too, too quickly and you still get reward, uh, if you haven't yet settled on the abstract structure, you might actually credit it to the wrong structure and then you experience interference between those two things. I'm not sure if that, if that makes some sense, but uh, the, the essence is that yes, if you enhance cognitive control, you should be better at learning to separate Task sets across different contexts and therefore be uh, faster at learning between them.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank uh, you. Actually, for the last question, uh, I beg your pardon. Uh, actually, uh, I have a question that is not directly related to the projects you are involving. Uh, it's about your insight and the way that you come up with the idea. First, uh, does the task uh, set or abstract, or abstract place it, your your idea? And uh, I mean, using them in in learning. And and the question is, uh, how in in what extent did you uh, come up with a method and you apply these, uh, you know, ideas and use scientific methods to uh, handle these, uh, uh, you know, projects. I mean, I, I really like to know about your insight because I'm really, really amazed by, by these ideas because I'm always thinking about using some mathematical, which is, is not, you know, observational, and then I want to apply it in, in my research. So I want to know about your insi insight. Thank you. Um, so I think that it, it's always hard to say whether something is my insight or any one scientist's insight, because the, on, the only reason we've had any success at all in uh, modeling phenomena and doing experiments that, that work out in, in some way or another is because of science, the way it builds on previous stuff. And you know, I'm not just saying that to, to be humble. I think that really is true. So this idea that test sets are involved in learning, uh, I think, in the precise way that we modeled it, it was a combination between Anne Collins, who's the you know the first author of that. She did a lot of that work, and we actually that, I think that's a good example because I hired her as a postdoc because she had done interesting work before I was involved in a different in a related context, on like an episodic context where uh, instead of um, instead of allowing context to be uh, things like colors or scenes or something that tells you what test sets to be in, she had already done some work on episodes where let's say you're, you're learning in some environment and suddenly things change and you, not, nothing tells you that things change. You can create a new episodic memory for that and create a new test set for that. And I found that her ideas on that were interesting and they actually related to some of the work that I had done with David Better that I mentioned briefly on these hierarchical circuits involved in hierarchical rule learning, which we didn't call task sets, but it turns out to involve very similar ideas. And so then we realized, well, if we work together, we may be able to make some more, um, you know, more headway on that. So really we built off um, her previous work and David Better's previous work and mine to, to develop that. And each of those, themselves, like the, the work that I did with David Better was on hierarchical rule learning, which developed based on his earlier work on hierarchical rules uh, and how the brain does that, and also relates to some earlier work on reinforcement learning and how these particular brain networks are involved in basic aspects of reinforcement learning. And, you know, you can go back and back and back, right? So um, I think you can't, if I, I guess if I have one advice for someone who's mathematically inclined, and you want to make an impact. It's not really enough to be a good mathematician and and think about theory. And, and I mean, there's a lot of value to that. But if you want to ask, how does the mind or the brain actually work? It is really important to also just read a lot of literature and read of what the experiments have said and look at the different methods across maybe even different species or different ways or different ways of looking at brain activity or looking at different um, measures of psychology. Uh, and that's how you're able to sort of put things together and not try to, it's sort of like you were, you don't want to create a new test set from scratch. You want to reuse some previous stuff. It's kind of the same thing. Thank you so much. Keep going the good job. Best wishes. Uh, thank you so much. Michael, many thanks again for everything. I really appreciate that. Uh, I it, was, it was a it was a pleasure. I hope it was uh, it was useful and um, enjoy the rest of your your workshop. Is continuing this week or is it finished now? Yes, uh, tomorrow. Oh, okay. And yeah, if anybody has any follow up questions, whenever you feel free to send me an email. I'm always open to that. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Okay. Bye bye, everyone. Bye. Uh, stop sharing.